So grateful to have Joel Beakey here with us today, and uh, I'm one of many who have profited from your ministry and your preaching, uh, the, the things you have written, all the work that you've done. So grateful for how the Lord has used you in my life and in the body of Christ, and thank you for spending a few minutes with us today to talk about preaching specifically. Um, let me just start with this. Why do you think that pastors should care about church history, and how would that help influence our preaching ministry and make us stronger at teaching God's Word? Yes. Well, church history is absolutely critical. And um, for just a whole variety of reasons, I actually wrote a little booklet on it with um, with Michael Haken, uh, listing a bunch of reasons why church history is important. But it's particularly important for pastors because this is kind of the laboratory in which we examine experiments that have been done and, and how our forefathers have taken the word of God, how they preached it, uh, how they pastored their people. Uh, we learn from the mistakes they made. We learn from the godliness they embraced and, and modeled. And uh, one thing is when you really love church history and you love reading about godly men who've gone before you. They're like your fans in the stands. Uh, mm. You know, Luther put it this way. Most of my best friends are dead. They're sitting on my shelves. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, when I when I read about Charles Spurgeon or, or George Whitfield or, or Jonathan Edwards or, or, or Samuel Rutherford or my heart is just stirred. My mind is is sharpened. My heart is stirred. Uh, I'm just moved to the core. And I want to be more like those godly men. So we have the same thing, of course, with scriptural characters. I mean, so much of the Bible is church, is, is biblical history, isn't it? Um, hasn't Enoch stirred you? He walked with God. Mm -hmm. Hasn't Caleb stirred you? He followed God fully. Hasn't David stirred you with all his... Uh, substantive comment in in the psalms well church history leaders do the same thing for us but we also learn from church history you know and all the confessions of church history what the summary of the bible is saying about every particular doctrine and then how they implemented those doctrines in their churches uh, one by one and how they walked how they lived out those doctrines that too, that too is very, very critical. So when you have a pastor who doesn't know church history very well, um, he is the, he's a big, he's he's got a big loss on his hands right there. Mm. For example, I've been 37 years in my church and now I have two brand new pastors, less than one year. You get in discussions in your session or your consistory room or your council, whatever you whatever you call it, and uh, time and time and time again, and, and these men can't help this at all. It's not their fault whatsoever. They just don't know all the decisions made in the past. Right. But time and time again, I'm I'm speaking up and saying, well, but, but seven years ago, you know, we made right. this <laughs> right, right. Oh, oh, okay. So the whole conversation turns. That's what you have when you have church history at your fingertips. Hmm. You have a lot more wisdom and, and guidance. So th those are just a few of the reasons. There's many more, however, many more. I just mentioned one more. When you study church history, don't forget to study the sermons hmm. of these great men and read their sermons on the same text that you are preaching on. Right. They have a wealth of material to teach you. That's great. That's so helpful. You know, one of the things that um, I think all pastors wish is that their their church members read more, read more widely, read more deeply. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the importance of church members, not not necessarily pastors, but just any Christian in reading the Puritans. Why would that be helpful? Uh, why should why should every Christian uh, how would they benefit from reading specifically from the Puritans themselves? Yeah, first, first of all, I'm really big on this idea as the pastor that you promote reading in your congregation of very edifying material. 
And it's not that nothing is being written today that's very edifying. There's a lot of good books being produced today. But you also want to read the old classics mm -hmm. that have stood the test of time. It's like, you, you know, you want to you want to sing new psalters and new hymns in your family for family worship. But you also want to sing the old ones that everyone resonates with. That's right. And it's the same thing with, with, with books. And uh, I, I just really am big on finding ways to get your people to read, uh, build bookcases and have them sprinkle throughout your church with, with books in them and slips in them and how they could, how could they could take that book home and maybe, maybe pay for the book during the week um, and, and encourage them, put, put a notice in the bulletin once a month, a book of the month that everyone should mm -hmm. read and just get them reading. Mm -hmm. And once they get reading, um, you'll see the whole level of holiness in your congregation. If you get them reading the really good classics, it will it will rise. They'll become more more godly Christians, more more serious Christians, more dedicated Christians through through reading. Now, in terms of reading the Puritans, oh my, um, I, I wrote an article once on nine major things the Puritans can can teach us, and. Uh, one thing I think that the Puritans teach me more than anything else is how to take the word of God and make it practical in my daily life. They called it uses. And so you see at the end of their sermons, at the end of their chapters, how, how do we use this doctrine I just taught you? Right. And it's very practical. And when you read, when you read the Puritans, start with, start with the Puritan Treasures for Today series, because every sentence is edited so a 12-year-old can read that without stumbling at all, without sacrificing content. For example, John Flavel, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear, William Greenhill, Stop Loving the World. These are all short books, like 70 to 150 pages, uh, paperbacks. Puritans that are very, very readable because every sentence has been edited like it was written yesterday. You can get them from heritagebooks.org. Start there, Puritan Treasures for Today. Then you move into um, Thomas Watson, probably the easiest Puritan to read. Kingdom of Heaven Taken by Storm is a great, great book. Then you move from there to John Flavel, John Bunyan. And then as a pastor, you should, you should work your way up to Thomas Goodwin, Anthony Burgess, and John Owen. Uh, but your people, you see, the order I just gave you, it's important you give that same order to your people. As a pastor, you should be able to jump in probably and, and get to Owen right away. But many pastors can't do that because, you know, when you once you get away from the King James Version, go to other versions of the Bible, and you're not reading old language at all, right. it's natural you start to lose it. So what you want to do is you want to... Get your people reading the Puritans. You yourself read the Puritans. And as soon as they read their first book, they'll come to you and they'll say something like this. Wow, pastor, this is amazing. There's no fluff in this book at all. Every sentence counts. And every sentence is, they're just, it's like they're speaking to me. So that's one reason. Another reason to read the Puritans is they teach us all kinds of very important helps. For example, they write a lot on how to cope with affliction. Mm -hmm. They are so mature with how to cope with affliction, how to mm -hmm. surrender it all into their father's hands. Read, if you're an afflicted Christian, read, you know, The Crook and the Lot by Thomas Boston or The Mute Christian on the Rod by Thomas Brooks. They also, they also milk to the full every biblical doctrine. So if you, you feel like you're having shallow views of sin, read The Evil of Evils by Jeremiah Burroughs. And you'll realize what a monster sin is. Or if you feel like you're not appreciating Christ as much as you, you were, read Christ All and in All by, by Ralph Robinson. Oh, what a treasure. You see, you take your shortcomings in your own Christian life, and you say, what Puritan has written on that subject? And when you read them, they're thorough. They'll convict you. They'll exhort you. But they'll encourage you. And they'll help you fly to Christ. Well, those are just two reasons to read the Puritans, but there's many, many more. I've I've been reading the Puritans since I was 15 years old. And well, actually started when I was 14. So I've been reading them what 55, 56 years. And I always have a Puritan book going at any time. And I read other stuff as well. 
but I find 99% of the time that the Puritan book does more for my soul than the contemporary books I'm reading. Well, what about if you were going to take some of the things you just shared, so helpful, thinking specifically about maybe personal holiness, is there a one or two books or one or two Puritan authors that for you personally has had the most profound impact on your desire for personal holiness and just your your progress and sanctification? Yeah, that's a good question. The the um, the whole volume, I believe it's either volume two or three of Thomas Brooks's works on the glory of Christianity, the holiness of the Christian, is um is a masterpiece of about about five hundred pages. I'd recommend that as is the, the first title. But there's also books that stir up holiness in you that aren't directly on the subject of holiness. For example, um, uh, Samuel Rutherford is, of course, a Scottish Puritan with a small p. You know, just reading his letters and his, his Christ-centeredness can stir up aspirations of holiness. Uh, Michael Baird and I have actually written a book where we glean from the Puritans. Uh, it's called, uh, it's by, by Christian Focus, it's called A, a Radical Complete Call. A, no, a radical comprehensive call to holiness mm -hmm. and we look at you know it's about 400 pages but we look at all the different aspects of holiness and a lot of that is gleaned from the puritans so that might be a place to start um it's published by christian focus also available from heritagebooks.org but i would I, if you want a puritan on holiness i would i would pick i would pick um thomas brooks overall but if you want to grow in holiness in certain aspects of the Christian life, for example, you want to grow in assurance of faith. Um, Thomas Brooks also has a wonderful book on that, Heaven on Earth, you know, a treatise on Christian assurance as a subtitle. And that will that book will definitely grow your holiness as well. Something that, that strikes me just in hearing you say that for back to pastors for a moment, um, if pastors want to create um, better disciplines in their congregation, the discipline of reading, the discipline of family worship, which I know you're very passionate about and have done a lot of work for. Um, wh what would you say to the pastor who maybe thinks to thinks to himself, I want to I want to increase my people's desire for spiritual disciplines, for just faithful disciplines, maybe just wrap up with some some concluding practical thoughts, not just with reading, but including family worship. How, how do we how do we grow spiritual disciplines better in the families of our congregations? Number one would be through constant preaching about what the Puritans called developing holy habits, holy habits in your own yeah. personal life, in, in your family life. And there's so many sermons that naturally lend themselves to applications at the end about growing personal holiness in your own life and in your family. And that's where you can bring in things about family worship. But I also suggest preaching whole sermons from time to time on these subjects. I love to preach a sermon, for example, on family worship to my congregation. I've actually preached it in hundreds of churches all around the world uh, because I think it's so important on how to lead family worship, a whole sermon based on Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. And uh, so I think I think that, that's, that's critical. But I also give them sermons on how-to sermons on how to read the Bible. I've had a whole sermon on how to read the Bible. I've, I've given talks to young people at youth camps, how to read your Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then how to pray. Lots of sermons on, on, on prayer. How do you take hold of God in prayer? How do you take hold of yourself and discipline yourself in prayer? Um, how do you develop a biblical form of prayer? The, these things. So, yes, I think number one would be to preach on it often. Number two would be to give your people good books on the subject um, and read, read a book together as a congregation. Say, okay, this month we're going to read 
chapter one of this book. And next month, we'll read chapter two of that book, same book. And, and you read a book in, in one year with a congregation. Right. Maybe you have a class on it. Maybe uh, we did a daily devotional by Robert Hawker last year where we asked everybody to get a copy of Robert Hawker's Poor Man's Morning Evening Portion. And we said, what we want you to do is read the daily portion every single day. And when you meet each other, talk about what you read. And uh, that's great. And it's such a Christ-centered volume. It's so savory. Yeah. So that was that was quite successful, actually. So be innovative. Find ways to 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 do that with your people, and talk with them when you visit them in 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 their families in their homes. Talk with them about uh, using the spiritual disciplines. So in our tradition, an elder and a minister or two elders go out every single year to every single family. So all. All 300 families get a visit. We call it family visitation, but it's also been called in the past soul visitation. Right. It was begun back in the 16, 1700s. But but then we ask questions like that. You know, how's family worship going? How can we help you do it better? Um, what books are you reading in the family? We, we ask the eight-year-old, are you are you reading your Bible every day? And you know, um, you, so you take spiritual inventory of families. Right. So there's a lot of different avenues you can work on to to try to really encourage your families to uh, pursue holiness and the fear of God through the spiritual disciplines. It really is about just caring for the souls of your people, right? It's just about truly loving your people, caring for their souls, and investing the time to get to know how they're doing and love them enough to persuade them and lead them into the things that matter the most. Yeah, and giving just practical directions, what to do. See, the Puritans would say, when you leave a sermon, you should have some convictions that you know, the pastor was very clear, I've got to change A, B, or right. C in my life. I've got to do something with this sermon. The sermon has been spoken. The sermon has yet to be done. That's right. where the Puritans excelled. Right. You you mentioned um, the, the quote when we were talking earlier, uh, I think from J.C. Ryle on about soul love. Um, yeah, soul love is the soul of all love. Yeah, and I think for preachers that for pastors and churches, I, that's such a helpful word um, that we want to study, we want to to minister, we want to lead, we want to help our people. But the heart of it has to be a love for Christ and a deep care for the souls of our people. Oh, amen, amen, brother. Yeah, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me, especially at conferences for, for some reason, all around the world. They come up to you and they say something like this. You know, I don't know, I don't know how to put this in words, but I, I've got a I've got this pastor. And you know, he studies hard for his sermons and he actually preaches really pretty good sermons. I learn things from them. I, I just I, Pastor, I don't know what it is. I just don't seem to feel like he connects with me. Mm. And I know exactly where they're going. They don't even realize it themselves. But it's a lack of pastoral love. Yeah. If you're there, you're loving them. You're there when they need you. You're calling them on the phone, praying with them, even for a small need. And you're thinking of them and you you know them. and And you combine that with good preaching and reform pastoral experiential practical preaching those people will love their pastor right but if they feel you don't care about their children or you don't even notice their children they walk into church right you, know, you, you, you you're losing it so you've got to you've got to love every single person that walks in that door and as a pastor that should be actually quite easy for us because we feel the burden of souls. We care about souls. Right. That that's so helpful. That that that's both encouraging and convicting. Um, I think so many men who believe what we believe um, value time in the study as well. We should, but I fear sometimes to the neglect of loving our people. You know, First Peter five: Shepherd the flock of God among you. We've got to be with the people, among the people, and love yeah. them. And yeah. and just hearing you share that is is both encouraging and convicting. I think 
to make sure that we are well prepared, but also we love our people at the same time. The, yes, exactly. And the point is, it's not, and this is where a lot of pastors get it wrong. And of course, at Pure Training Farm Seminary here, I'm, I'm working with this kind of stuff all the time in practical theology and Christian ministry courses. You get this mindset, even of some theological students, that they think you've got to make a decision. Am I going to be primarily a preacher or primarily a pastor? I say, no, you do both. You do both. You organize your time accordingly. Yes, you're going to be busy, but you organize your time accordingly. Do the best you can right. in both categories. If you come to a Friday night and you're still not prepared for Sunday and you've got a Saturday morning visit with someone, you may have to call them up and say, brother, I'm, I'm really, really sorry, but I, I don't want to put you off at all. But can, this is not an emergency. Can we meet on Monday? Well, first of all, don't make any visits on Saturday. But <laughs> can, can, we, can we meet on Monday? I've had to do that a couple of times. I just, I cannot sacrifice the preaching time. But you can do a lot of pastoring and you can do a lot of pastoring even over the phone, I find, in my own, in my own ministry, because there's just too many people to visit. I can't make it to everyone as often. But an older member has a birthday. An older member has an anniversary. You call them up on the phone and you you pray with them on the phone earnestly. You spend 20 minutes. Well, 20 minutes isn't very much. You don't have to drive anywhere. You don't have to change your clothes. You don't have to, you know, you know what I mean? You, you, you make a wise use of your time, but don't neglect pastoring. Do both. Right. You can do both. That's so good. You know, the, the Lord and his kindness has allowed me to, the church I pastor here in Oklahoma, I've been here for 23 years. And I'm so thankful that he's allowed me to be here for so long. And one of the things I love about it is, is we're starting to see people who, when I came here 23 years ago, were children. Now they're married. They oh, were yes. children. Now they're having children. And, yep. and that love and affection you feel for them just grows deeper and deeper and deeper through the years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you'll be interested in knowing that I'm writing a book about that very subject right now. It's like 95% right? done. It's called Persevering in Pastoral Ministry. And there is a chapter in there on um, that I feel very strongly about the advantages of maintaining a long-term ministry. Wow. And that's one of them right there, brother. That's That's an important one. And so you become, and you feel it deep in your heart, don't you? You, you do. become more and more of a father to the whole flock. And so uh, that means that people will come to you for advice on all kinds of things, which makes you all, all the busier in one way. <laughs> but at the same time, people will understand you've got, in particular in your case, you've got a large congregation. They'll They'll get a feel over the years of what you can do and what you can't do. That's what I experienced here, being here 37 years. I have hardly anybody will come to me with trivial stuff that, you know, they really don't need my help for just to shoot. Right. Nobody will come to me and just shoot the breeze. They know how busy I am, but every situation I mix among the people, I show my friendliness as best I can and my love. And I ask them questions and you maximize Saturday night. We had a picnic for three hour picnic. I must have prayed with, I don't know how many people in those three hours, but, mm -hmm. but close to a dozen, just going around from person to person. How are you doing? Oh, how, how, that aunt was suffering over here. Um, your, your, your brother, how, how's he doing? And you try to remember as much as you can, but you right. enjoy it also. You enjoy pastor and mm -hmm. loving your people. This is the gift of God. This is, this is your extended family. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. It's been such a pleasure to be able to, uh, spend these moments just listening to you and 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 what you've shared has been so insightful both for pastors and for just all of our church members um, to to want to know Christ better, know His Word, connect with our history, and just to to know Christ and love Him and to love our people. I, I appreciate the way you've modeled that, the way you've led out on that, and thankful for the ministry the Lord has uh, gifted to you as a gift to the body of Christ. I really appreciate you. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate being with you. God bless you and bless your church and bless your family. Thank you, sir.